Mr. Authority. For the reasons given in the judgment I'm handing down uh, this morning, uh, Ping's appeal uh, against the decision of the Competition Appeal Tribunal is dismissed both as to liability and as to the level of the penalty imposed. Appeal for judgment. The Queen on the application of British Telecom PLC and Her Majesty's Treasury and another. Uh, for the reasons stated in the judgment uh, handed down by me now, this appeal is dismissed. The appellant shall pay the respondent's costs of the appeal to be assessed on a standard basis if not agreed. Appeal in the matter of Fern and others and the Board of Trustees of the Tate Gallery. May it please your Lordships and your Ladyship, I appeal with my learning friend Richard Moores for the appellants. My learning friends Guy Jefferson Hawke, you see Eileen McColgan and Elizabeth Fitzgerald appeal for the respondent. I would like to start, if I may, with a brief summary of the appellant's case. Well, can I, you've got a lot to get through, as you know, because we, we're interested in uh, the issue of justiciability, and you've very kindly, both of you, given us uh, some material on that which we've read. Uh, so there's a lot to get through. So just for your assistance, uh, you ought to know that we've really we've read the judgments very carefully. We've read all the skeleton arguments and the, the matters that the, the document you sent us yesterday. We've read, uh, certainly some of read, most of the big, the, the main authorities. So I think just to make sure you can both get through everything you've got to say, you don't need to recite the facts to us. No. Uh, we've got all that. I'm grateful for that indication, and I'll take my submissions as quickly as I can. So, starting with the summary of our case, as your Lordships and your Ladyship will have seen, Mr Justice Mann, when he came to the claim in nuisance, started off by putting to rest a legal controversy dating back to the 1930s by holding that a privacy invasion by overlooking is capable of being a nuisance. There's no cross appeal against that finding and we say for the reasons given by the learned judge, he determined that legal issue correctly. The learned judge then made factual findings to the effect, that contrary to what the Tate had argued, the dedicated viewing by visitors to the viewing platform into the appellant's homes is seriously interfering with the enjoyment of their homes. Now, we simply say that having made that legal ruling and having made those factual findings, the learned judge's work was done. The learned judge then simply needed to apply one of the most basic and most important principles of the law of nuisance, namely that unless you are doing something necessary for the ordinary use of land, you cannot use your property in a way that substantially interferes with your neighbour's occupation of his property. Or to put the point, same point in a different way, every property owner is entitled to enjoy his property free from substantial interferences caused by the activities of his neighbour. save in relation to activities that are necessary for the ordinary use of land. So given the learning judge's factual findings, there was only one way to apply that basic principle. Those factual findings were, as I've said, to the effect that the Tate's, Tate's viewing platform does substantially interfere with the appellant's use of their flats. But at the point at which the judge should have been applying that most basic rule of nuisance, he instead, first of all, misdirected himself by posing the wrong overall test for determining whether the Tate is committing a nuisance, by asking whether the Tate is making an unreasonable use of its land. And then in the course of applying that wrong test, 
the judge engaged in some ad hoc legal reasoning that is contrary to well-established legal principles. Now, my lords and my lady, I, I'm in your hands as to the order in which I address those matters. I was proposing to address the matters set out in the email from the clerk to my lord, the master of the rolls, at the end of my submissions. Yes, I'm not, I'm not quite sure about from the submissions you've made to us, is whether you're saying this court has no jurisdiction to visit the question of jurisdiction, uh, justiciability rather. Well, it is it's not a ground. If that is your submission. It is uh, not a ground of appeal, but... Uh, it's not a ground of appeal. If, if we, can, if we, can, if, we can if decide court, whatever we want. If the, exactly. If the court wishes to revisit that issue, I am here to assist the court and to make submissions. Oh, very I, do, I do point out in passing that it is not a ground of appeal. It may well, that, that may well be so, but it's certainly something we are very interested in. And so, yes, that seems like a good starting point. You would like me to start with that? Well, it's entirely up to you. I mean, I, I, thought, I, I, I thought that I was, was a good starting to, point. I was proposing to leave that issue to the end for this reason, that um, we feel it might be helpful for the court to hear our submissions on, on the principles of nuisance before I address you on whether nuisance is extendable to... That's absolutely fine, Mr. Speaker. You take the course you want so, my lord, tur turning to our first... Before you embark on that, are you accepting that for your clients to win, the law of nuisance would have to be extended? Well, our, our claim is in nuisance. We're not appealing against the uh, determination by the trial judge that the Tate is not a public authority. So, certainly based on our pleaded case we need to establish a claim in nuisance. Yeah, but you said in answer to my Lord Master Rolls that the question of whether the tort of nuisance was extendable. So I'm just asking, yeah. are, are you accepting that it would have to be extended in order to... Oh, if, if you're right. well, as you've perhaps seen from the submissions at the trial, we say, in any event, the common law uh, provides a cause of action in nuisance. So... Um, I mean, we certainly don't, don't say that it would require an extension by, by Article 8. So if we start with our first criticism of the learned judge's reasoning, namely that he applied the wrong overall test, uh, your lordships and your uh, ladyship will see the way in which the judge framed the overall test, first of all, at page 52 of the four bundle. I've taken my judgment out, so if you can... So it's paragraph 175. Thank you very much. This paragraph 75... I'd ask, ask you to read... Uh, paragraph 175, and then over the page 180. So the way the learned judge framed the overall question was whether the Tate was making an unreasonable use of its land. I also point out that in paragraph 180 he uh, refers um, to uh, the uh, fact that the appellants have to put up with some give and take, give and take appropriate to modern society. Where are you reading from then? This is the middle of paragraph 180. Oh, yes, there's a given yes. uh, And then he broke that question down into the three elements of location, use of the defendant's property, 
and nature and use of the claimant's properties. Yes. Now, the it, it was a misdirection for the judge to determine the claim by asking whether the Tate was making an unreasonable use of its land. The learned judge adopted that incorrect test because he had misread the passage from Lord Newberger's speech or judgment in Lawrence and Fent Tigers referred to in the first sentence. But there is a, a bit of a sort of legal backstory didn't he have to, to that. Didn't he have to ask that question really in the interest of your client? My Mr. Hudson-Hall can, can, can take this up in due course, but at the moment, my understanding is that if, if the defendant's conduct has been unreasonable, then uh, if, um, uh, as you said, there's been a, 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 an inappropriate interference with the claimant's enjoyment of their land, um, then plainly uh, that's actionable. If, however, it's, it, it's uh, merely the fact that it's reasonable use isn't sufficient, what the defendant has to show is that it was... N if, they, if they are unreasonably interfering, if they are interfering in such a way with the, defend the claimant's use of the land as to make its amenity um, less, less enjoyable, then the only defence of the defendant is to say that my use was necessary and appropriate for the use of my land. That, he had to start off by asking, well, was your, was your use reasonable? If it was unreasonable use, then you're going to be liable. Well, it's been repeated over and over again by judges that the way in which the judge framed it is a misdirection. And it was just a, it was focusing on the wrong person. If you're not dealing with a situation where um, uh, activities which are necessary for the use of land the, the only question is, is a matter of degree, which is whether the harm to the victim of the interference is sufficiently serious. Yes, I suppose, I, I'm trying to make a point in your favour in a way, or rather I think the judge was, uh, you can read the interpretation of the judge on this point, as starting off by saying, well, was the defendant's use of the land one reasonable or unreasonable? Was it necessary for the use of his land? Those are the three questions you have to start off by asking. If it was an unreasonable use of the land, then they're going to be liable. Uh, if it was a reasonable use of the land, well, that, that simply knocks out the unreasonable use. Uh, but the only defence is uh, if your use of your land, the defence use of the land, is necessary for its enjoyment. So I don't, I don't understand at the moment why he wasn't in time to ask the first question, well, was the Tate's use of its land unreasonable? Well, if, if the Tate was acting maliciously... Yeah, well, that'd be the end of the story. Exactly. But outside the outside of the context of malicious use, um, and outside the context of um, use that is necessary for the occupation of land, the question is solely focused on the victim, yeah. and you simply ask whether the harm was sufficiently serious. It was a matter of degree. Yeah, well, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I think the point I'm trying to make is that you have to start off by saying, "Was the use? Of, I don't know. Was this part of your case?" before the judge, that the Tate's use of its land was unreasonable. No. We were ne it was never suggested that, was that not it was uh, sort of malicious. And the test that the judge applied was not, he wasn't invited to apply that test by anyone. I see. So you say that reasonableness is irrelevant. It's, it's, it's malice. It's, outside of malice and activities necessary for the use of land, yeah. the reasonableness of the Tate's use is irrelevant. Fine. And, and we find that by one of the leading cases on... I mean, it, 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 there are many cases, but to, to, I, I want to, if I may, quickly as possible, track through the background, legal background, to what uh, Lord Newberger said, to just explain how the mistake arose. And to do that, we need to go back to Bamford and Turnley, which is a divide of one of the vulnerable authorities. So this is a leading case on nuisance. It's had a great influence on the development of the law. It, it's tab one. 
So this was a brick built, a brick burning case. The bundle of authorities. Yeah, I, I should have said we, we passed up a supplemental bundle of authorities on the issues relating to the email. Yes. So this is a brick burning case. The defendant bought a plot of land on a housing estate and burned bricks to enable him to build a house. The plaintiff lived with his family on adjoining, uh, an adjoining plot and alleged that smoke and smell created by the brick burning was a nuisance. Now, page 29 of the report, at the mark passage, you'll see the direction given to the jury by the trial judge, the Lord Chief Justice. So you'll see that it's stated that for the Lord Chief Justice at the trial, he directed the jury on the authority of a case called Hall and Barlow to find for the defendant, notwithstanding his burning, the bricks had interfered with the plaintiff's comfort if they were of the opinion that the spot where the bricks were burnt was a proper and convenient spot and the burning of them was under the circumstances a reasonable use by the defendant of his own land. And based on that direction, the jury held the defendant was not liable. Now we can see how the argument squared up in the Exchequer Chamber. Back at page 27, you'll see the, we've marked it up, the submission made by the plaintiff. Plaintiff argued that the only question is whether there is a real substantial injury to the plaintiff. Over the page, right at the foot of the page, we see what the defendant said. At the foot of the page, it was said by the defendant that every person must enjoy his own property subject to the inconvenience necessarily resulting from the reasonable use by his neighbour of his own land. An exchequer chamber held that the plaintiff was correct on that issue. The judgment of Mr Justice Williams starts at page 29, delivering uh, the judgment of himself and three other judges. And at page 31, uh, towards the top of the page, Chief Justice sitting on appeal with his own direction. Mr. Justice Williams, the judgment of Chief Justice. Yes. Williams. I hadn't, uh, I hadn't spotted that. <laughs> page 31. Yeah. Page 31. If we start in the middle of the page, you will see that the majority concluded that we are of, the, of opinion that the decision in that case, that's Hole and Barlow, was wrong, and consequently that the direction of the Lord Chief Justice, which was founded on it, was erroneous, uh, that the verdict of the defendant ought to be set aside and the verdict entered for the plaintiff. And the principle that they applied, you will see at the top of the page, three lines in uh, from the first full paragraph, they said the true doctrine is that whenever taking all the circumstances into consideration, and where are you reading from now? This is the top of page 31, okay. three lines into the, the, the first full paragraph, the true doctrine is that whenever taking all the circumstances into consideration, including the nature and extent of the plaintiff's enjoyment before the acts complained of, the annoyance is sufficiently great to amount to a nuisance. Uh, that then there is liability. So it is a question of degree whether the interference is sufficiently bad to constitute a nuisance.
Now, Baron Bramwell gave a uh, judgment uh, with the majority. It has been enormously influential. It starts at page 32 of the uh, report. And if you could turn to page 33, about seven lines down from the top of the page, the, the learned judge was asking whether there is some exception to the principle that you are liable for causing an interference uh, to your neighbour's use, a serious interference to, to your neighbour's use of its uh, land. And uh, he says, about seven lines down, it seems to me that the principle may be deduced from the character of these cases, and is this, that those acts necessary for the common and ordinary use and occupation of land and houses may be done, if conveniently done, without subjecting those who do them to an action. The word necessary. Necessary. Which is critical. Here. Yes. And conveniently done has been held, it was held in Southwark and yeah. Mills, to involve showing reasonable consideration for your neighbour. Yes. So the principle means that it is you are able to run a bath, mow the lawn and trim hedges. You're able to put up shelves. Even if those things seriously interfere with your neighbour's <coughs> use of his property, but you, in doing those sort of things, you must act with reasonable consideration for your neighbour so you can't mow the lawn at three o'clock in the morning. Now there is an important final paragraph to Baron Bramwell's uh, judgment, which you'll find at page 34. And in that paragraph, he says that the he finds it difficult to put any meaning on the words convenient, reasonable, and proper in the case uh, that was before them. But about seven lines up from the foot of the paragraph, he does say that those words are perfectly intelligible when applied to such nuisances as would form the common and ordinary use of land. So the learned judge seems to think that there is some scope for the concept of reasonable use of land in the context of his uh, exception to the general rule relating to activities necessary for the ordinary use of land. So since at least the mid-19th century, in order to establish whether someone's activities, use of land is a nuisance to their neighbour, if you're not dealing with a situation where their activities are necessary for the common use of land, as I've said, the question is simply one of uh, degree of seriousness of harm to the neighbour, and the, the proper approach is, is nicely set out at Divider 7 of the uh, Bundle of Authorities, a case called Vander Panton Mayfair Hotel. So it's the judgment of Mr Justice Luxmore, page 165. Uh, to 166, and I'd invite uh, your lordships and your ladyships to read the passage that we have marked.
Now, the ultimate source of the judge's misdirection in our case is what Lord Goff said in uh, Cambridge Water and Eastern Counties Leather. And your uh, lordships and your ladyships will find that at divider 14 of the bundle. So, you'll, as you'll probably know, this was a case where the defendant operated a tannery and it used chlorinated solvent to decrease pelts, which contaminated uh, groundwater. The House of Lords held that the claim failed because the harm was not foreseeable. Uh, the passage that has caused the problem, ultimately, in our case, is at page 299. Uh, D to F. And I should say, the, at this point, Lord Goff is discussing the possibility of liability under the rule in Rylance and Fletcher. And he was making the point that liability under both nuisance and Rylance and Fletcher is strict. But then he goes on to say, of course, uh, I think it was that um, passage at E that I was referring to. If the user is not reasonable, the defendant would be liable, even though he may have exercised reasonable skill and care to avoid it. But, but you, you say even that's not correct. You yeah, say, that's you not. You say that, it's malice. That is not correct. And it, it's slightly unclear what Lord Goff is doing here, but he, he's certainly introducing the concept of reasonable user. But certainly four lines in, he seems to be equating uh, that idea with the principle of give and take, which is Baron Brownwell's doctrine, which is principle, which is applicable, as we've seen, only to uses or activities necessary for the ordinary use of land. Which is in the quotation. Yes. The yeah. But the, f the final sentence is a bit puzzling, <coughs> but it does seem to be talking solely about that uh, principle, that rule of give and take. slightly confused about this. I, I understand your point that if the user is malicious, then if you've taken all reasonable skill and care to avoid it, you're liable. I understand that point. But why, why do you balk at his proposition that if your, your use of your land is unreasonable, then you're also liable? I mean, it's a slightly, it, 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 that's more favourable to a, to a claimant, isn't it? You seem to be raising, it's just, just to be raising the, the, the bar for a claim. Well, well I'm just under, I don't understand why. It's just not a relevant question to ask. I, How I, the defendant this is, this it, it is, I, I suggest, this is not a particularly clear paragraph, but thankfully the lack of clarity has been resolved, as we'll see, by the subsequent case law. Mm. And I, I just simply say, on the basis of the case law, if you're not dealing with malicious use, and you're not within the ambit of Baron Brownwell's uh, principle of give and take. The only question, you don't focus on the perpetrator of the nuisance, you focus on the victim and simply ask whether the interference is bad enough to be a nuisance. Right, I think your, I think your point, Mr. Weeks, is that the first half of the sentence after the quotation from Baron Brownwell puts the case puts the law in the wrong way. What Lord Goff is saying there is that if the user is reasonable, the defendant will not be liable for consequent harm to his neighbour's enjoyment. And I think your point is, well, that's not the whole law. It's 
it's not enough simply to ask, is it reasonable, end of story. You have to ask whether it's reasonable given, given its effect on the neighbour's land. Because whatever you are doing has to be done with due consideration for your neighbour's enjoyment of his neighbouring property. If you're within the bounds of yeah. Baron Bromwell's yeah. rule, and we're not in our case, it's not been suggested we are, we're obviously not. What, what, I don't understand that. What, what would you say are the bounds of Baron Bramwell's rule then? I can, I can quite see that if it's malicious, then you're in one situation and that's not the case here. But if I think what you were saying is that if even if the user of the def, by the defendant of his land is reasonable, if it causes a sufficiently serious interference with his neighbour's enjoyment of his land, then that will be a nuisance unless the defendant can show that it's necessary for him to use exactly. his land. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So the the sort of Bats backwards and forwards a bit as to who has to show what. What I'm not clear about is where the give and take. Well, the principle of give and take, this is the rule of Baron Bramwell described his exception to the general rule. The general rule being if you seriously interfere with your neighbour's use of land, that's, an ex that's a nuisance. The exception is if your activities are necessary for the ordinary use of land. In that situation, you still need to act with reasonable consideration for your neighbour, and he call, called he called that principle the rule of give and take. So you don't say you don't accept that give and take is relevant to the assessment of whether the detriment calls to the claimant's enjoyment is sufficiently serious to be actionable? No, it's not a balancing exercise. It's a question of degree. Yes, in some cases the difference between something being a question of degree and it being a balancing exercise might be quite... But you're not balancing the sort of interests of the perpetrator of the nuisance against the interests of the victim. You're solely focusing on the victim and asking if the interference is sufficiently serious to be a nuisance. Right, so in deciding what everyone has to put up with, if I can put it like that, in terms of interference, the reasonableness of the activity that's causing the interference is not to be taken into account. No. Well, I, I've always understood the give and take proposition to be simply a reflection of the principles of law that determine whether or not there's an actual nuisance. In other words, it's not in itself a separate principle. It's simply a summary, in sort of lay people's terms, well, that the law provides with it, within itself for what is the give and take. Well, that's not how Baron, Baron Brownwell. He came up with the doctrine. That's not how he uses the... Uh, that's not what he calls the rule of give and take, and it's not how it is understood by the subsequent case law. So you're loading the word must be conveniently done, the, the, that aspect of his dictum, with this give and take. Yes. Is that, is that yes. it? Yes. The necessary activities must, as well as being necessary, have to be conveniently done. Yes, they have to be conveniently done with reasonable consideration for your neighbour. So as I say, you can trim the hedge, mow the lawn, even though those things might substantially interfere with your neighbour's use of the land, but you have to act with reasonable consideration for your neighbour in doing those things, so you can't mow the lawn at three o'clock in the morning. I mean, the, the, that passage from Lord Goff's speech might become clearer as we look at the subsequent case law. 
So I've said the sort of ambiguity. That, that particular point about being conveniently done isn't at the heart of this case because you simply say it's not necessary for the tent to have this gallery. It may be perfectly okay for it to do so. It's not unreasonable, but it's not necessary. It's not equally, it's not being suggested they were malicious. No. So we don't actually need to, for the purpose of this particular case, the give and take point doesn't really arise, does it? Or it doesn't, no. As you say, it doesn't arise. It doesn't arise. The next uh, case I'd like to take you to is in volume two of the Board of Authorities, Southwark and Tanner. Sorry, Divider, yeah, Divider 18, Southwark and Tanner. Uh, my Lord, Lord Justice Lewison will no doubt recall this case because he uh, appeared in it. Withering fire from Lord Hoffman and Millet constantly. <laughs> so this was a case where tenants of some local authority flats were disturbed by the noise from the ordinary everyday activities made by their neighbours. And the problem arose from inadequate sound insulation. And uh, the House of Lords held that the local authorities were not liable in nuisance. And they applied Baron Brownwell's rule of give and take. And they asked themselves along the way to asking whether the local authorities were liable for the inadequate sound insulation, whether the neighbours could be committing a nuisance. And they held the neighbours couldn't be because the of Baron Brownwell's principle concerning acts necessary for the... I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt, but my, my binder is not usable. I can't turn over the pages if someone has an alternative. Can I swap this? The passage I'd like to take you to is the passage referred to by my Lord Lord Justice Lewison a, a while ago. It's at page 20 of the, the uh, report in the speech of Lord Millet. And I'd ask you to read the uh, marked passage at least over the page up, up to the reference to Ball and Ray.
So uh, Lord Miller starts with the proposition that law of nuisance is concerned with balancing the conflict of interests of adjoining owners. And I accept at the sort of highest level of generality that is correct. Um, and I rely upon the fact that in the second paragraph, the learned judge confirms that it is no answer to an action in nuisance to say that the defendant is only making a reasonable use of his land, notwithstanding the confusion that may have arisen as a result of what Lord Gofford said in Cambridge Water and Eastern Counties Leather. Exactly, and, and in fact, we, the, way, the, the way we formulated the test to the judge was exactly in using those words. Uh, adopt, adopted uh, from. Look at the bottom of the page of H, it says that this might be perfectly reasonable, there's no one else around, and the other is not a good neighbour, so again, you bring it um, Can I just ask you about Paul Ray, the quotation on page 21? Between C and D in the quotation, Lord Selborne says, if the houses adjoining each other are so big that from the commencement of their existence it's manifest that each adjoining inhabitant is intended to enjoy for the ordinary purposes for which it and all the different parts of it were constructed, then so long as the house is so used, there's nothing that can be regarded with nuisance. Now, here the viewing gallery has always been used for the purpose for which it was constructed. Yes, but they weren't, he's talking about uh, a situation where the houses were built at the same uh, time. Now, I think he's talking about a situation well, where he's talking about... The same here, the, 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 the Vatnik building in your block went up at more or less the same time. Well, it, it didn't. The near bank side was completed in 2013. The Blavatnik building was completed in 2016. But I think what the learned judges referring to here is the principle that in determining whether an interference is sufficiently serious to be a uh, nuisance, you could take into account the nature of the locality. And I think the learned judge is there thinking that if, you, if you're talking about a row of houses built at the same time, uh, that the existence of those houses should be treated as part of the locality. <coughs> case is the important case of uh, Bar and Differ, uh, which you'll find at Divider 24. <coughs> so in this case, the defendant operated a refuse tip. The owners of many adjoining houses alleged that the smell on the refuse tip was a nuisance. <coughs> the trial judge dismissed the claim in nuisance. The Court of Appeal allowed the appeal and ordered a retrial. Lord Justice Carnworth delivered the only substantial judgment. And it's an important case because it was held that, that the judge in this case had made the same, directed himself in the same way as in our case by asking whether the defendant's use of the land was reasonable. And it was held by the Court of Appeal that that was a misdirection. Now if we could start with page 462 of the report. Paragraph 5, four lines in. However, in their essential features, the law and its application to facts could, and in my view, should have been seen as relatively straightforward. It's so unfortunate that the judge was persuaded to undertake what became an elaborate reinterpretation of the law of nuisance. And he said that the common law is at its best when it is simple. Page 468. 
paragraph 36, the judge said, in my view, the case is governed by conventional principles of law of nuisance, which are well settled and can be found in any of the leading textbooks. And he says that relevant to this case, the following rules, and over the page, is the, the, the governing principle in this case and in our case. Roman 1, there's no absolute standard. It is a question of degree, whether the interference is sufficiently serious to constitute a nuisance. And I also refer, point out that at uh, Roman 6, the learned judge records that the public utility of the activity in question is not a balance. And that, that is contrary to what the Tate says in paragraph 20 of its skeleton, but it is a, it's a well-known principle of the law of nuisance. Uh, paragraph 41 over the page, the judge said that, judged by these principles and in the light of these authorities, the case against Biffa seems reasonably clear-cut. The introduction of pre-treated tipping had resulted in a series of episodes of unpleasant smells affecting the ordinary enjoyment of the residents' houses and gardens. They were not just isolated or trivial occurrences, but continued to attract substantial and credible complaints. And then over the page, paragraph 44, without disrespect to the defendant's efforts, I continue to believe that the applicable law of nuisance is relatively straightforward and that the 19th century principles for the use, for the most part, remain valid. Although I examine the judge's reasoning in more detail uh, later, the essential points can be shortly stated and shortly answered. The following are the main building blocks of the judge's reasoning. He said that the controlling principle of the modern law of nuisance is that of reasonable user. If the user is reasonable, then absent proof of negligence, the claim must fail. And the judge held that the use was was reasonable because it complied with the regulatory regime. At the foot of the page, the learned judge said that reasonable user is at most a different way of describing the old principles, not an excuse for reinventing them. Page 475, I'd invite you to re read the passage we've highlighted. Over the page, page 476, that then starts a review of the case law. He quotes the difficult passage from Lord Gough's, Gough's speech from Cambridge Water that I've referred your uh, lordships and your ladyships to. Page 65, he says it's to be noted that Lord Gough was not here seeking to redefine the ordinary law of nuisance. Rather, he was citing well-established principles as a starting point for considering the scope of Wall and Rylance and Fletcher. 66, although no doubt apt for Lord Goff's purpose, the concept of reasonable unit does not appear to have a very solid pedigree in the earlier case law. The judge rightly referred to Bamford and Turley as a leading case on this element of the, law, uh, the common law. 67, Baron Bramwell himself did not, in terms, propose a te test based on reasonable user. Although, as I pointed out, he did think the concept of reasonableness did have some role to play uh, within the ambit of his rule of, rule of give and take. Over the page, paragraph 68, the learned judge refers to the House of Lords case called St. Helen Smelting and Tipping. And just about halfway uh, down the page, he just over that, he quotes um, 
he says that it is of interest to compare uh, compare what was said in the House of Lords with what the judge said in the lower court uh, in rejecting the pre-Bamford law. And he said that's a concise statement which holds good 150 years later. That decision, i.e. Bamford and Turnley, establishes that where a case of nuisance is sought to be made out, it is not the right question to put to the jury to say whether the place where the act was done was a proper and convenient for the purpose or whether the doing it of it in that place was a reasonable use by the defendant of his own land. And then finally, uh, the over the page, page 478. And I'd ask you to read the passage that we've, we've highlighted. So the upshot of this is that the... So what, what, I mean, what is the pan from paragraph 71? It's really, I, isn't Lord Justice Calm there reiterating what I was putting to you? He explains uh, Lord Goff's use of the words reasonable user as, in his words, no more than a shorthand for the traditional common law tests. That's how he explains it. That's how he explains it. Yeah. That's what I was putting to you. Actually, one way of looking at it is to say that what Lord Goff was just talking about was he was simply saying, well, the, the common law tests themselves tell you what is a matter of law is reasonable. It doesn't matter. I mean, this is it doesn't it's a, really matter. I, I'd have thought a matter of semantics. The upshot of this case is that the principles set out in uh, Bamford and Turley remain good law, yes. and it is a misdirection for a judge to determine a nuisance case by asking whether the defendant is making a reasonable use of his land. Yes. So I'm almost ready to take you to the judgment. Final case, divided 25, Lawrence and Fen Tigers. Page 830, we have the start of Lord Newberger's judgment. And paragraph three, he, he starts by saying that the nuisance can be defined, albeit in general terms, as an action or sometimes a failure to act on the part of a defendant, Sorry, which is... Behind you, which paragraph? Paragraph three. Which is not otherwise authorised and which causes an interference with the claimant's reasonable enjoyment of his land. Or to use a slightly different formulation, which unduly interferes with the claimant's enjoyment of his land. So that's setting out the general rule, whether the interference is sufficiently serious as a matter of degree. But then in paragraph 5, he refers to Lord Hoffman's rule of give and take. So not every substantial interference with the use of land is a nuisance because of that rule. Well, he, he, I, I'm, I'm saying that the, he first of all sets out the general rule in paragraph 3, and then in paragraph 5 he 
sets out. Well, his, first, his first formulation causes an interference. That, that can't be right because it's got to be of some substance. Unduly interferes, maybe closer, but it begs the test of what is undue. Um, well, it may, may be an imperfect way of setting it. I, I'm, I'd suggest that in paragraph 3, the learned judge is attempting to express the general rule, albeit perhaps imperfectly. But what you say is that it, when, when he quotes then from Lord Wright, the test about what is reasonable according to the ordinary usages of mankind living in society, that is directed as what it is reasonable for the claimant to put up with, rather than what is reasonable for the defendant to be doing on his own. Sorry, you're talking about paragraph three. I so, am. Yeah, yeah, unduly interferes with the claim. It's, it's, he is it's perhaps an imperfect. No, no, but the, the next sentence, Lord writes. Oh, I see. He says, useful test is what is reasonable according to the usual, to the ordinary usage of mankind living in society. But that is directed at what it is reasonable for ordinary mankind to Put up with. Put up with, rather Given the, than... In light of the extent of the interference. Yeah. yeah. Yes, well, of course it'll be in light of the extent of the interference, but I... But judge solely I, by that. But then what I'm not clear about is whether I thought you were saying that the give-and-take idea is not relevant at that <coughs> stage, but now you seem to be saying... No, no, I'm, I'm saying that there's a general principle that you can't use your land in a way that substantially interferes with your neighbour's use of it, his property. But that is subject to Baron Bramwell's rule of give and take. And that, that applies only in respect of activities which are necessary for the ordinary use of land. So and it is point. in that context that there might be some scope for the principle of reasonableness because you, it's been held that you must show a reasonable consideration for your neighbours when you carry out activities. But your, your initial submission in response to my Lord the Master of the Rolls, which was that the reasonableness of the, the, when the cases talk about the defendant's use of the land being unreasonable, what they are talking about is not unreasonable just as the opposite of reasonable, but as meaning malicious. Uh, I, no, um, oh. my, my submission is that outside of Baron Brownwell's rule of give and take, it's a misdirection to frame the question in relation to reasonableness. The question is, is simply a question of a degree. Is the harm sufficiently bad to be a nuisance. I think we're getting into a bit of confusion there. My understanding of where you are is, you, is in fact that reason, there is an element of reasonableness that you have to, that you have to um, assess for both the defendant and the claimant. In the case of the, defend, in the, case of the defendant, uh, it, it's, only a, uh, it's only a defense where there has been an improper interference, a bit like that, or an undue interference with the claimant's reason to join to the land, if one, the defendant's use of his land is necessary for its ordinary use, and two, what they do, uh, or what the defendant does, is, in Bram's words, conveniently done. But conveniently done can also be used in modern land. People don't actually talk to each other nowadays by saying, did you do that conveniently? They said, did you, were you reasonable in what you did? In other words, not only was it necessary, but was it reasonable what you did? And so to that extent, there is, as my lady suggests, actually an element of reasonableness using modern language yes. for conveniently done. Yes, absolutely. I so that, so that, there is an element there of were they... So that's the first. The second thing, which is what, as my lady has said, it seems to me correctly, is being said in last sentence, paragraph three, isn't looking at the defendant's position at all. It's looking at the claimant's position and saying, well, in judging whether or not 
uh, you're entitled to complain about what the defendant's done, uh, it, you've got to look at the ordinary use of this land by an ordinary person. That's the not too insensitive, not too sensitive person. That's what that's looking at. What's reasonable according to the ordinary use of mankind. Isn't, isn't that right? Yes, I'd accept that. So, that's I mean, accurate. So there is actually, using modern language, an element of reasonableness throughout, but I totally take your point uh, that it's no defence just to say, well, I use my land reasonably. Yes, that, that is a yes, I mean, I think accurate, I, I'm sorry if I haven't made myself clear enough, but that, that is an accurate summary of our submission. So we can now look at the... And there may be another rule floating about in relation to maliciousness, but we don't have to concern yes. ourselves with that. That's right, no if you maliciously to... interfere with your neighbour's use of land, that is automatically a nuisance. It would almost automatically be unreasonable. <laughs> but it certainly won't be necessary. <laughs> so, turning to the learned judge's judgment in our case, if we could turn to page 39 of the war bundle. Thirty-nine. So, and I'd like to take you to Roman four at the foot of the page. Lord Newberger, uh, the, the learned judge quotes from the passage, quotes the passage from Lord Newberger's judgment in Lawrence and Fen Tigers that we've. Uh, C. And then over the page, paragraph 131, he says that the nuisance in this case, if there is one, would have to be of the third kind. The invasion of privacy is said to result in the sort of things referred to in three above because the utility of the land as a dwelling house or its amenity has been interfered with by the frequent invasion, invasive inspection of the interiors and the people within, to the detriment of the land itself, and the claimant should not have to put up with this even on a give-and-take basis. And that's the first sign that something's going wrong with the judgment, because that is a reference to Baron Bramwell's uh, give-and-take principle. So what's wrong with that? The question you've been saying all along is the claimant shouldn't have to put up with it. He's focusing on your part. Is this, is this something which they should, be, they should have to put up with on a give and take basis? Well, it, the, 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 the question that way is that. Well, so I'm, I'm asking, is the use of the viewing gallery a reasonable use? He's it, saying, is its effect on your part such that they have to put up with it? In the passage above, in Lord Newberger's passage, uh, paragraph 5, he refers to the Baron Bramwell's principle, and he describes it as the principle of give and take. Yes, because that's, he's reading it, as I think, as I was putting to you before, which you didn't accept, that you could interpret give and take in modern terms as simply the summation of what the, all the ordinary principles are. The law defines what is a reasonable give and take. But certainly on one reading of this, he, is, he thinks he is bound to decide the case on the basis of Baron Brownwell's principle. And we, we think that's where the mistake is made. But in any event, right, because as we say that, that when that give and take is not an appropriate phrase to use when you're assessing how serious the damage is to the victim of the activity. Exactly. It suggests a balancing yeah. between the interests of the perpetrator and victim. Right. Whereas the question is simply, what is the effect on the victim? Is it bad enough to be a nuisance? leaving entirely on one side whether the source of that is um, an activity which is reasonable or unreasonable. In some okay. sense, yes. Yeah. So when it comes to Right. 
So if we could perhaps go back to page 53. So having applied the wrong overall test, the judge is focusing on the wrong per party, is focusing on the Tate rather than the appellants. And the judge in his reasoning makes no attempt to do the only thing that he was required to do, which was to ask whether, as a matter of degree, the impact of the viewing platform on the claimant's enjoyment of their lands, uh, their flats, was sufficiently serious to be a nuisance. So he should have been saying, given the opening times of the viewing platform, the number of people who use it, the impact on the appellant's use of their flats, is this sufficiently serious to be a nuisance? So the judge made no attempt to do the only thing he was required to do. And also, as a result of asking the wrong question, the judge mistakenly relied upon aspects of the way the Tate operates the viewing platform that were totally irrelevant to whether it is committing a nuisance. And to, to explain uh, how the learned judge did that, if we could start by going back to page 42 of the There, the learned judge refers to um, an article in the Law Quarterly Review from 1931 um, by Professor Winfield, who's the co author of the well known book on torts. And I'd ask you to read between letters D and F. Has that case actually been identified? Because there's a, there's a, it says a footnote refers to cases on yes. talk fourth edition. I mean, have we have we found out what it is? The the, the answer is yes. I, I did, uh, a first instance, find the uh, reference to the case in. It's a footnote in, as you can see, a book called Cases on on Tort. Yes. What was the name of the case? I I'm a, I, I, I'm, I don't I'm not sure if it was even the case name was even referred to. I mean. We will provide you with the... Yeah, that would be helpful just to yeah. see what it was. Anyway, the, the claim failed in the okay. case to which Professor Kenny refers, and Professor Winfield says, why? Why should it have failed? Yes, exactly. And that has been it's quite an influential article in the context of privacy law. The judge then says that the article is cited by the dissenting judgments in the Australian case of Victoria Park racing and recreation grounds. And he quotes from a passage of the judgment of Mr. Justice Evert, who was in the minority, but the learned judge thought that the views of the minority judges were to be preferred. So over the page within the judgment of Mr. Justice Evert, six lines down, referring to Professor Winfield's example, he says that in truth, no normally sensitive human being could have pursued his profession or business under so intolerable an espionage. And the result would have been to render the business of the premises practically uninhabitable. And then if you read the rest of that passage, you'll see that the learned judge came up with his own example, something which he thought would be a nuisance. Right, but the, the judges who um, relied on that paragraph in Winfield and the Ballam Dentist case were in the minority in the Victoria Park racing case. They were. Yeah. But the learned judge thought the minority was correct. Right. Where, where is this taking us? 
it, it, I, I'm just, just getting there. This is the background to an example the judge himself came up with, which you'll find at page 50 of the bundle. Uh, and I'd ask you to read from letter D to the end of that paragraph. Sorry, which page? It's pe sorry, page 416 of the uh, report, page 50 of the bundle. So letter D to the end of the paragraph. Right. So... You agree with him? We agree with him, but the, the, the point I draw from this is that by formulating the test in the wrong way, <coughs> he's bringing into account things that are irrelevant the learner judge thought that for the purposes of whether the Tate was liable, it mattered whether the Tate was charging a fee for the viewing platform. Well, I thought your criticism of paragraph 169, is he's gone back to the question of is it an unreasonable use of a first neighbour's land, which you say is not the that, question. That, that, that is not the, the question. The question you say at this stage, yeah. at any rate, is, is it an unreasonable interference with the other neighbour's yes. land? Yeah, so I, do, I do say, say that. You say that, that um, where his example may be a good one, the reasons he was given for it yeah. are not good. But also it goes slightly further than that. We, I mean, the tater saying, well, the judge may have used the wrong overall test, but the reasoning is appropriate for the right yeah. test. And we, we're, I'm drawing your attention to this to show that the judge was, in deciding that the tape was not live were a nuisance, having regard to matters that were irrelevant. The judge thought it was relevant whether the tape were charging a fee, and also whether the visual... Where is that, where is that referred to? Well, charging the fee point. Just below letter D. So what he says is that... Oh, I see. So the, he doesn't yeah. say, it doesn't translate that to the tape. Anyway, the main point, my Lord is... I'm trying to cut this short. The main point is, my Lord has pointed out, is you object to the sentence below that it would be an unreasonable use of the first neighbour's land. I do, but the, the, that's judge, the, point that's the, the judge is saying if the Tate was, had a viewing gallery just looking at a residential property and also charging a fee, that would create a liability and nuisance. But in our situation, there is no liability and nuisance. So it's clear that the judge thought that it was rele relevant to whether there was a liability and nuisance, whether the Tate was charging a fee, the extent of the visual offering provided by the Tate, and these are things that are irrelevant to the well, question. You say they're irrelevant because they don't affect the impact exactly. of the viewing exactly. on the amenity of the flat. Exactly. So this is an example of a judge not only formulating the wrong test, but taking into account things that were irrelevant. <coughs> That's right, but if you ask yourself why is this example, does he think this example is a nuisance? And what is actually going on isn't a nuisance. You ask it, what are the features that distinguish the two situations? The features are that in his made-up example, the perpetrator of the interference is charging a fee and the viewing platform is focusing only on the victim's property. Whereas in our situation, the Tate is not charging a fee and the visual offering is wider than just near a bank side. And these are matters I'd say are on the correct test. Irrelevant. I'm certainly following all your argument, uh, understanding your argument. It seems, however, an awfully long. We seem to be an awfully long way from the denouement of the judge's analysis. And as, I, as I, as I read his judgment, he was with you that, in principle, the law of nuisance, even without Article Eight, would extend to this sort of activity. He was with you on the basis that Article Eight uh, would justify an extension. Where he was against you was in the uh, at the end when he was saying that that the claimants had unduly sensitised their land. 
And that was a matter that, that seemed to be the kind of clincher point. Now, you may say he also said at the end about a sort of reasonableness point, but we seem to be quite a way away from I, I, I entirely, I know I haven't spent too long on my first point, but I entirely agree with your lordship. The crux of the judgment is the judge's... Um, Those two points at the end, really, it's one that said whether or not, as a matter of principle, the judge was right to introduce this idea that when you're in this kind of third, what's called the third category, the amenity issue, the, where, where the damage is to the amenity value of the land to the, op, to the, um, to the claimant, whether uh, you can have a kind of a counterfactual of a different type of building on the land. That's the first, it seemed to me, issue, the principle. Uh, and he decided that, as it were, against, uh, he decided that against you. And the next point you may say is that in elaborating on that, he gave examples of what could have been done, and that's part of the give and take, and that's all to do with the reasonableness. But now that also, I, I'm, I'm just encouraging you in a way to get to that I, part. I'll, I'll get to those points right away. And I, I also would say that I, we agree with you, that they, they are the crux of the, the matter. So I'll turn to them straight away. Page 58 of the core bundle. So, paragraph 202, the judge <coughs> says in the second sentence that this assessment relating to sensitivity depends on what the hypothetical alternative design is. And then at C, he imagines, he says, my imaginary building has significant vertical and perhaps horizontal breaks to interrupt the inward view. So that is the assumption upon which the judge bases his analysis. And our first criticism of this part of the judgment, it is impossible for the parties or for your lordships and ladyship to identify what the learned judge had in mind, even in broad terms on the basis of that assumption. Well, I assume that your basic point here is there's no authority and none is cited by the judge for a counterfactual of this kind. And the second point is you have to take the land as you find it. I assume that's what you're... Yes, I, I, I will pass on. For, I mean, we, I, I will get as rapidly as I can to the, the crux of the matter. But we, we do we do have a criticism of the this part of the analysis being based on that, that assumption. Uh, paragraph 203, the learned judge then um, says that on the basis of that assumption, there would be no nuisance. Over the page 204... He then talks about parallels with the nuisance cases about sensitive users. And in paragraph 205, he says there's a clear analogy there. And so he's talking, as, as you'll be aware, about the principle that a claimant cannot establish a claim in nuisance if a neighbour is substantially interfering with his land only because he's making an abnormally sensitive use of the land. And there's also a related rule that you cannot establish a claim in nuisance by relying upon abnormal personal sensitivity. Now, we say that the existence of those principles is a consequence of nuisance being a tort to land. And this was noted by my lord, the Master of the Rolls, in a case called... Williams and Network Rail, which you'll find at Divider 27 of the Bundle of Authorities, Volume 2.
So it's page 614, just to the left of letter F. So nuisance, uh, claim in nuisance relates to harm to the land, to what is objectively regarded as the amenity value of the land. Uh, and so as I needn't take you to the passage, but as Lord Lloyd said in Hunter and Canary Wharf, the harm would be the same whether the property, the claimant's property was occupied by a single <coughs> person or an entire family. So if you're trying to work out what objectively should be regarded as the harm to the amenity value of the land, you obviously need to disregard abnormally sensitive occupiers, but you also need to judge the interference by its effect on the normal and ordinary uses of the land and to disregard the effect on any unusual use, making it abnormally sensitive to a particular interference. So, so back to the uh, judgment of page 59 of the core bundle. Pa paragraph 205 is a very important part of the judge's re reasoning. I'd ask your lordships and your ladyship to read that paragraph. Paragraphs 208 and 209, he then talks, and 2010, he talks about the winter gardens. So these were parts of the flats originally conceived as a type of internal balcony. The developers had installed the same flooring, including underfloor heating as in the remainder of the flats. And the claimants used the winter gardens in the same way as the remainder of their flats. So the judge said that the, the claimant's sensitivity to nuisance was increased by the fact they used the winter gardens simply as part and parcel of their li living accommodation. And then we have uh, paragraph 211, which again is uh, the second very important paragraph in respect of this part of the reasoning, and I'd ask you to read that paragraph. Now, an important question for the court is, is what exactly is going on in this part of the judgment? Is it the case that the judge is taking the principle relating to sensitive users and simply applying that principle to sensitive, abnormally sensitive buildings? Or is the judge doing something else? And we, we submit that the judge is doing something else. The reasoning in paragraph 205 has nothing whatsoever to do with the flats being abnormally sensitive properties to invasions of privacy. Two oh five.
what he says in 205 is, is twofold. It's the relevance of the glass is both that it makes the occupants of the flats more vulnerable to being viewed, but also, he says, it attracts the views of the people on yes. the viewing gallery. That's right, but he's, he's not there saying, this is not reasoning supporting a finding, that these flats are abnormally sensitive to invasions of privacy by overlooking compared to properties generally. Well, that must be right. I mean, the, the well, fact that, must be right. Sorry? The fact of it must be right. That, it, that if these flats were largely brick with modest-sized windows, people would not look at them and they would not be so vulnerable uh, to being... It, it is certainly true that if you compare the flats as they are to the same flats with smaller windows, the level of interference would be less, of course. But my point is, in 205, the learned judge is not reasoning to support a conclusion that, compared to homes generally, these flats are abnormally sensitive to an interference with privacy by overlooking. I would suggest the judge is applying the following principle in that paragraph, that for the purpose of establishing a claim in nuisance, a claimant cannot rely upon any interference with his use of land arising from anything that he has done, which has increased his sensitivity to the interference, so long as there was an alternative acceptable so, so long as there was a, a, an alternative would have been acceptable. Would have been acceptable to him? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So for the purpose of establishing a claim of nuisance, a claimant cannot rely upon any interference with his use of land arising from anything that he has done which has increased his sensitivity to the interference at least as long as there was an acceptable alternative. Now that principle is obviously wrong. A claimant can establish a nuisance by relying upon interference with his use of land caused by things that he has done which have increased his sensitivity to the nuisance. To give examples, there's an example we put in our skeleton. I mean, suppose I own a factory that is raining down dust and debris on my learned friend's open-air theatre. I can't defend the claim on the ground that the open air theatre has created its own sensitivity to the nuisance by building an open air theatre rather than an indoor theatre, which would have been perfectly, a perfectly good theatre. modify the example slightly. Suppose my factory has deposited dust and debris onto my learned friend's car parked in the open on his forecourt. And the dust and debris has damaged the paintwork of his car. I can't defend the claim in nuisance on the ground that the damage was caused only because my learned friend chose to increase his sensitivity to the harm by choosing to park his car in his forecourt rather than in his garage. The judge's principle is inconsistent with one of the core principles of the law of nuisance, the principle that it is no defence to a nuisance that the claimant 
has come to the nuisance. There's a whole series of things which uh, the judge thought uh, amounted to self-induced sensitivity. The, the, you're quite right to say the architectural style is part of that. There's the use of the winter gardens. And the Tate want to supplement what the judge said by referring to the fact that, as originally designed, near Bankside had louvres mm. on the outside of the building. And Precisely to stop people looking in. Well, it was, it was as the judge held, uh, it, was, it was to stop looking in between the uh, buildings in you know, Bankside itself and also between those buildings and existing residential uses. So it wasn't designed to stop overlooking from the uh, viewing platform. But your Lordship is quite correct that uh, there are um, a number of aspects in which the judge thought and the Tate would say that the problem has arisen because of self-induced sensitivity. But my point is that the principle that you can't rely upon self-induced self, uh, uh, sensitivity is just wrong. And I was the point I was making is inconsistent with the <laughs> principle that it is no defence that the claimant has come to the nuisance. In other words, it's not a defence that the defendant has located himself close to the source of the nuisance. And that's obviously a case in which uh, the claimant, if the claimant has located himself close to the source of the nuisance, that's a case where the claimant uh, is a case of self-induced sensitivity. this off quite quickly. I, I'd also point out it's, it's contrary to the Article 8 cases. So I needn't take you to it, but we've included in the bundle von Hanover and Germany. It's the well-known case of Princess Caroline of uh, Monaco being photographed in public, eating meals, playing sport and so on by photographers uh, from German magazines. And it was held that uh, that was an infringement of her Article 8 rights. But applying the judge's approach, the princess would have had no complaint because the harm that she'd suffered was as a result of her own self-induced sensitivity by choosing to appear in public places rather than staying at home. And just apply to our case, the principle applied by the judge operates unfairly. You know, as a, as a result of buying flats with big windows, the appellants cannot fairly be said to have lost the right to complain that the Tate is operating a viewing platform, encouraging hundreds of thousands of people each year to engage in viewing into their homes. That is not a natural consequence of buying a flat with big windows. That's not the price you pay if you buy a flat with big windows, it's not something you should reasonably expect to put up with. Over the page 
back to page 60 of the core bundle, it is correct to say that in paragraph 211, the judge does say that I therefore consider this to be a case in which the claimants are occupying a particularly sensitive property. But there is no reasoning capable of supporting that assessment. The reasoning in paragraph, the learned judge may have thought the reasoning in paragraph 205 supported that assessment. But you don't, you don't uh, conclude that the claimant's flats are particularly sensitive by comparing those flats with the same flats with smaller windows. You'd have to compare the flats with residential properties generally. Maybe, maybe you'd say in that location. But the comparison, the comparator, is not with the same flats with smaller windows. It is where it would be with other properties. And we would say that it would not have been open to the judge to have held that even with their big windows, the claimant's flats are abnormally sensitive to privacy invasions compared to other properties. There is certainly an aspect of the flats which increases their sensitivity to privacy invasions by overlooking namely the big windows. But there is also an aspect of the flats which greatly reduces their sensitivity to privacy invasions by overlooking namely the location of the flats. So the flats are situated a long way from anyone who might want to look into the flats. They're on the 13th, 18th, 19th, 21st floors. And they're a long way, a comparatively long way from any other land from which an interference privacy invasion might come, uh, apart from the highway. So given the location of the flats, if you take that into account, they were not abnormally sensitive to privacy invasions by overlooking, notwithstanding their big windows. I'm quite conscious of the time. Because you've got to, I think you should try to finish by, uh, by lunchtime. We'll have a right of reply. Would you like me to move on from this point to the... Well, it's up to you how you... Uh, you know, is, is, that, is that the last point that you want to make? Well, uh, in relation to the judge's reasoning. So where we've got to so far is you're saying the judge adopted the wrong test as regards reasonableness. You haven't really sort of tied that into this end analysis. And you say that the judge uh, looked at, started off by looking at the reasonableness of the defendant, of the Tate's user, and that wasn't the right approach, and we've got that analysis. But then when we come to the end of his conclusion because he's with you that it's actually was a nuisance, he's with you that it's actually a nuisance irrespective of Article 8, he's with you that Article 8 adds weight to it. He then does this issue about increased sensitivity, and you've dealt with that, but you haven't really kind of tied in, if I may say so, at least in my mind, your point on reasonableness with the end analysis. I mean, how does that fit in, that criticism? Well, these that? are separate criticisms. The overall well, I know, but, but how does that feature into the end result? Because I said he was with you right up until this point. I mean, even if the judge made an initial error, he still came to the he still came in, in, down in your favour on actionability. So I'm trying to work out, therefore, what, what how does all that criticism really feed into the end result against you? Well, the, the crux. I mean, the, the way it sort of. The judgment went wrong for us on our side, as your uh, lordship has pointed out. Was the what he said about sensitivity? I mean, I thought and I thought what you were going to say is I thought what you were going to say. Say so. I thought what you were going to say. If you take two one five, that he's gone through all of these things that 
They could have done this. They could have installed privacy film. They could have installed net curtains. They could have done this and they could have done that. And then he concludes at the end of 215, looking at the overall balance which has to be achieved, the availability and reasonableness of such measures is another reason why I consider there'd be no nuisance in this case. And I thought you were going to say, well, there he is, there he is, coming back to this point about overall reasonableness. Exactly. So that's he, a, it's so. a balance. He, he, so he thinks it's a balance. That. I'm just trying to see how that fits. Is that, is that where it fits in? Yes. Okay. He, he thinks it's a balance. He says somewhere towards the end of the judgment where he returns to the question of the reasonableness of the viewing gallery. I suppose impliedly he does because he makes his dismissal of the claim the conditional upon the Tate having limited the hours in which the viewing gallery is open and having the uh, warnings up asking people on the gallery not to look into the windows. I mean, is that, do you say that that is an aspect of him going wrong because of his incorrect emphasis on the reasonableness of the user. Well, the well safe to the extent that that didn't feed through in terms of the extent of the harm to the appellants, that would be wrong. So can, I re can I return to 215? Because I, I, I think, I'm so sorry. Did you, had you initial? Yes, I did. Um, uh, 215, because it, it, what's interesting here, he says, it's unusual for a nuisance claim to be met by the defendant saying the claimant could take remedial steps to avoid the consequence of the act. But this is an unusual case. Then if we go down a few sentences, he says, however, privacy is a bit different. And then he ends that, so that paragraph saying, looking at the overall balance which has to be achieved, the availability and reasonableness of such measures is another reason. I mean... But as I said, that's where I thought you were going to fit well, it in. It, that, that is an example of him going wrong by applying a balancing exercise rather than asking himself whether it was a matter of degree. If the inference was so sufficient. You, know, you rely on 215. I do. That. Is there anything, I mean, I want to make sure you put all your points. Is there anything else that you feel is important for you to put to us on the analysis? It's in 220. Um, he says that the assessment under Article 8 is almost identical to the balancing exercise between the defendant's use of the land in the locale in question and the sort of give and take that would be reasonable for the claimant. Exactly. That, that you say is... That's clear, another example. That's an incorrect yeah. summary of the common law test. The, ju 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 the judgment is peppered with this idea he's carrying out a sort of balancing exercise rather than focusing simply upon the... reasonableness the... of this person's use and the yeah, reasonableness exactly. of them, the victim having to put up with it. Exactly. The, ju the judgment is peppered with uh, that uh, incorrect approach. If I could address you on uh, paragraph 215, on the, what the judge said about the appellant's ability to adopt screening. So this is contrary to the approach that is taken in nuisance cases. If I could start with divider 11 of the Fund of Authorities. This is a case, an Australian case. The plaintiff complained about golf balls being struck into uh, his property from uh, a municipal golf course. And if I could take you to page 10 of the report. invite you to read the passage we've highlighted. Uh, 
that's all I want you to read in that case. Divider 12 is the well-known case of Miller and Jackson. This Australian case doesn't matter, is it Miller and Jackson? It, it pro probably doesn't. It's, it's pro you're quite right. It, it may have been unnecessary to, for me to take you to it. Miller and Jackson is the important domestic authority on this question. This was cricket balls being struck from a cricket ground into a uh, neighbouring house. And the Court of Appeal by majority held that the uh, cricket club were committing a nuisance. If I could refer you to page 984 uh, in the uh, judgment of Lord Justice Geoffrey Lane, and I'd invite uh, your lordships and ladyship to read the passage we've highlighted. And that the principle appears at the top of page 985 on the second line, starting on the second line, there is no obligation on the plaintiffs to protect themselves in their own home from the activities of the defendants. And Lord Justice Cumming Bruce agreed with this judgment. And so the principle is that when faced with what would be a nuisance caused by your neighbour, you don't have to occupy your property in a way which it wouldn't normally be occupied. That's the principle. And there's a divide of 13 is an authority to the same. It's a Scottish authority where the uh, you'll find uh, an attempt to formulate the principle. This is Webster and Lord Africa. This was an alleged, it was a flat owner complaining about the noise created in preparing for and the performance of the Edinburgh military tattoo. Lord Stott at first instance, you'll see at page 181, I'd ask you to read the passage we've marked. formulates the principle is that in dealing with such a situation the pursuer is required to do no more than conform to the ordinary habits of life as a reasonable person. So you're not required to occupy the property in an unusual way that you wouldn't ordinarily uh, do. But the uh, appeal was allowed. So the, 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 yes, you're quite right. There was, a, there was then an appeal uh, but the appeal was confined solely to the terms of the injunction. Just, uh, I'm almost there. If I could just go back to the uh, judgment in relation to this aspect of the reasoning, paragraph 215, page 61 again. In the middle of paragraph 215, the judge says the privacy is a bit different. Susceptibilities and taste differ. And in recognition of the fact that privacy might sometimes require to be enhanced, it has become acceptable to expect those wishing to enhance it to protect their own interests. We, don't, we, we say that that reasoning doesn't make sense. Uh, the fact that susceptors, susceptibilities and tastes differ is true of many things that can cause nuisances, for example, noise. People are troubled by noise to very different extents. But it, I mean, 
quite sure it is. If the test is one of a reasonable person of reasonable firmness, whatever the corpus and self test is, then individual susceptibility is Exactly, that was my second point. In any event, the judge has adopted an objective analysis which has ironed out uh, individual susceptibilities. Well, that, that's a different point. The sensitivity of the individual is a different point from the vulnerability of the particular flats because of their design to um, being overlooked. Yes. Yeah. And in respect of his second point, that privacy might sometimes require to be enhanced as become acceptable to expect those wishing to, it, to enhance it to protect their own interests, we find it very difficult to understand that point. It would suggest that you can't have a claim in nuisance for arising from overlooking because in the case of an invasion of privacy we always expect the victim to remedy it. But the judge himself obviously didn't think that was uh, the case because he himself gave an example of a situation in which overlooking would be a nuisance. I'll move on from that point. So I think the final point is the relates to the points made in the email the parties received from the clerk to my lord the master of the rolls. Yes. And as I understand those points, I, we're basically being asked whether the judge was correct to hold that privacy is an aspect of the immunity of land protected by the law of nuisance. Now, we, we rely on our side on the detailed submissions we made on that issue in our closing submissions at the trial. And we rely upon all of those submissions now. But for the purposes of uh, today's hearing, if I could just give you six sort of headline points. First of all, the Tate conceded that in appropriate circumstances, privacy was an aspect of the immunity of land capable of protection by nuisance. I needn't take you to, to the judgment, but it's at paragraph 169 D to, B to C. B to C. Aspect of the amenity of land capable of protection by nuisance. Is privacy the right word? We are talking about being looked at. Well, we, we can narrow it down the, the concession related to being looked at. So, privacy by overlooking. If I put it that way, was an aspect of the immunity of land capable of protection by nuisance. My second point is the learned judge thought that even in the absence of Article 8, the law of nuisance would probably protect privacy, uh, in particular privacy by overlooking. And the reference there is paragraph 169. My third point is that the planning system offers insufficient protection against privacy invasions by overlooking. Whether for the purpose of Article 8 or more generally.
I've got three sub points there. My first port sub point is that the planning system is not designed to protect the rights of individuals. Instead, it's designed to make decisions in the overall public interest. The Supreme Court gave careful consideration to the relationship between the planning system and the law of nuisance in Lawrence and Fen Tigers. If I could take you to that case, it's divided 25 of the bundle of authorities. We could start with Lord Neuberger's uh, judgment, and in this respect, with, with whose judgment Lord Sumption and Lord Mance uh, agreed. If I could take you to page 849. And this is in the context of the learned judge considering whether the, the relevance of a grant of a planning permission uh, to whether a nuisance is being committed. And I would ask you to read paragraphs 94 and 95. Page 862, letter D, Lord Sumption makes the same point. And at page 865, uh, Lord Mance, at paragraph 100, 165, says that he agrees with what Lord Newberger said about the significance of planning permission. Now, I draw your attention to the final two, two sentences in that paragraph. The general public interest may have led to a particular private interest being overlooked or overridden. So all of this obviously postdates the um, Hunter and Canary Wharf and uh, what Lord Hoffman said about planning in that case. But my second sub point on planning is that, so my first point is the planning system is not designed to protect private uh, rights. My second sub point is that a privacy invasion by overlooking from neighbouring land might result from something that is not regulated by the planning system. So 
So if I invite a friend onto my hill to engage in dedicated viewing into my learned friend's home, that would not require planning permission because it wouldn't be a material change of use. I, I suppose if it was sort of, um, uh, I mean, I, perhaps... I mean, if, you are, if you are turning your field into Henman's Hill, you might find that you have, there is a change of use. Yes, yes. But I, all, all I'm suggesting is to ask, one can come up with examples of privacy innovations by overlooking that wouldn't be regulated yeah. at all by the planning system. And another example might be as a result of permitted development. I mean, suppose that Neobanks was originally offices, and suppose that uh, the viewing platform hadn't caused a sufficient interference with the occupiers of the offices to be a nuisance. It would be possible to rely upon permitted development rights to change the use of Neobanks to flats. And so, which would, would create a nuisance, and so that's a situation of a nuisance by overlooking being created in a situation not uh, covered by the planning system or not regulated by uh, the planning system. My final sub-point is that even to the extent that the planning system uh, should have regard to, as part of its balancing exercise, should have regard to invasions of privacy by overlooking, the problem might in any case be overlooked, as happened in this case. Or the, the, the planning system might identify a problem of overlooking, but fail to predict how bad it would be. So we say privacy is just like all other aspects of the immunity of land. Some protection is offered, provided by the planning system. But in addition, landowners enjoy the protection of the law of nuisance. The fourth of my six points is that the Tate is wrong to say that nuisance is an inherently inappropriate vehicle to give effect to Article 8 rights. So the argument is that nuisance and Article 8 are just totally different. Nuisance is a tort against land, whilst Article 8 protects individuals. So, for example, the Tate says that Article 8 would provide protection for someone with only a licence to occupy land, whilst the law of nuisance would not do so. And as you will probably be aware, that was the outcome of Hunter and Canary Wharf, that someone with only a licence would have no claim in nuisance. I, I would just make one point about that, which is that Hunter and Canary Wharf was obviously decided before the right to privacy under Article 8 became incorporated into English domestic law. And I will draw your attention to, it says divider 15, page 714. 
So this is the dissenting judgment of or speech of Lord Cook. I'd ask you to read the paragraph between letters B and D. So he's dissenting on the majority's view that a mere licensee has no claim, uh, can't claim a nuisance. 714 is the first full paragraph. So I, the, the point is there, first of all, that Article 8 is construed to give protection against nuisances. Uh, and also the fact that he thought, this was obviously before Article 8 became part of English law, that due amongst other things to Article 8, that was a, re a reason for modifying the law of nuisance uh, to allow nuisance claims. Yes, so as nuisances. I understand this submission, you're saying that uh, contrary to Hunter, the position now is that uh, as a result of uh, the Human Rights Act and Article 8, uh, a claimant uh, can claim in nuisance even though they have no property interest in the land at all? I'd, I'd say it's arguable, but my, my point is really sim simpler than that. It is simply that the fact that nuisance is a tort of land can only provide partial protection of Article 8 rights does not mean it should not protect Article 8 rights when it can do so. Well, yes, but if, it, if it's... if it's... a matter within Article 8, then the obligation of the state is to provide a remedy for it. And this, this highlights... this passage from Lord Cook's speech highlights the slight oddity here, which is that the children living in these flats do not have a claim in nuisance because of being overlooked, whereas we know from the Strasbourg Court's jurisdiction that sometimes the, the fact that someone whose Article 8 rights are being invaded is a minor is, a, is an aggravating factor or, or might give them a right where an adult might not have a right. Um, but are, are you saying that actually here the children living in these flats would have a right in nuisance under Article 8, even though they don't have a property interest in the flats? That is perhaps arguable, but I, my submission is simpler than that. It's, it's simply just because one can envisage situations, perhaps close to our case, where Article 8 rights couldn't be fully vindicated through the law of nuisance doesn't mean that where the law of nuisance can vindicate Article 8 rights, that it shouldn't do so. So to take my lady's example, we've got a family consisting of two adults and children. Adults have a property interest that children don't. They both suffer exactly the same relation of privacy. Who can sue for what? It, it's, well, the harm is to the immunity of land, and when one is considering the harm to the immunity of land, it would be appropriate to have regard to the uh, to the uh, effect on children living in the flat, uh, objectively viewed. So, really, sorry, sorry. the title to this to this item four, the heading. Tate is wrong to say that nuisance, going back to nuisance, is inherently the wrong vehicle to give effect to Article 8 rights. I, I'm just not quite sure. I, 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 it's propositions are, are relevant. What is perhaps too simple? It is simply that just because you can envisage circumstances where Article 8 rights couldn't be vindicated in a situation like ours through nuisance 
isn't a reason, in our case, not to allow Article 8 rights to be vindicated uh, in a law nuisance when, when that is per it involves a perfectly conventional application of the principles of nuisance. Maybe I'm overcomplicating it. Well, I think what, you're, point, what you're saying is that it may be that you can't stretch the law of nuisance to cover everybody exactly. who would exactly. have a, a justifiable, justifiable complaint, but you can stretch it to people who have an interest in the land and have a justifiable exactly. complaint. So There's no, so. in our case, it doesn't involve any impossible stretching of the principles of nuisance. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that would be a bit of an odd result. If you're going to, if, if the complaint is, well, um, let's assume that otherwise, without Article 8, the law of nuisance wouldn't be sufficient. That's, that's where we're at at the moment. Without Article 8, the, the, the law, and then you say, but Article 8 makes it appropriate. It would be extremely odd if you then said, well, normally, if, if, our, if we were just looking at confidentiality as a, as a private right, and privacy is a private right, Article 8 would apply to all these people. But because we're tacking it on to nuisance, which it otherwise wouldn't apply to, only some of them have these rights. That would be quite an odd result. But then in the smell and noise cases, if there are children in the house, they probably don't like the smell or the noise either, but they don't have their own cause of action. No, that's true, but that's because... But your point is Article 8 extends the right. So we're not considering Article 8 in relation to any of those other categories. Anyway, and I put the, I'm put i putting that proposition to you, that it would actually be an odd result. Oh, that, okay. that, you, know, cause you can look at Article 8 in two ways. You can either say, right, um, uh, Article, 8, uh, Article 8 requires the law to provide a remedy for invasion of privacy in these circumstances. You can say that. It ought to do so. Not sure it has done so, but it would ought to do so. And therefore, the best vehicle for doing that is um, is to extend the cause of action for nuisance. But it would be quite odd, I, I'm putting to you as a proposition, it would be quite odd that you should do so, converting what would otherwise be a, a personal cause of action under Article 8, um, which is protected. Uh, into something which is a property right, but it only extends to part some of those people who will be protected by Article 8. It, 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 it would, it, it, that, that odd result might suggest that actually Article 8 is not dealing with property rights at all in this context. It's to do with personal rights, which the, which the law ought to justify, ought to, ought to satisfy. Well, That's what I'm putting to you. first of all, I refer back to what Lord Cook said in Hunter Canary Wharf. Well, the trouble is he was a dissenter. But, but I don't think it's controversial that Article 8 does give protection against things that would be nuisances, and he gives a number of examples, aircraft noise and, uh, and fumes and smells from a waste treatment plant. So what we're, we're seeking to do now is not <clears throat> sort of unorthodox. Yes, yes. Those are, but those are personal rights, aren't they, under Article 8? But, I mean, making... Perhaps I can. Hey, well, I've got the proposition. <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I can, I've got the perhaps proposition. address you by making my fifth point. Yes, sir. Uh, I wonder if this answers it. Yes. Uh, I'd suggest it, in addition to perhaps thinking about those more sort of abstract legal questions, I, I'd suggest it's important for the court to focus on the particular facts of this case. That English domestic courts are a duty under Section 6 of the Human Rights Act to protect the right to respect for privacy uh, accorded by Article 8. In the absence of an overarching tort of privacy, it must be protected for existing causes of action. 
we say on the basis of Mr Justice Mann's findings of fact, the appellant's Article 8 rights are being infringed. And therefore, the court owes a duty, if it can, to vindicate those rights through an existing cause of action. And we say the most natural way of doing so is through the law of nuisance, because this is just classic nuisance territory. It is an activity on the Tate's land that is substantially interfering with the amenity of the appellant's land. Why couldn't it even be said it's, it's actually even more, or even more straightforward for the law of confidentiality and privacy to be extended? Well, that, that is another option. The difficulty uh, with that was referred to in the leading uh, textbook on uh, privacy. If I could take you to the supplemental fund of authorities. Sorry, you're talking about, uh, yes, uh, by the uh, extending the, Oops. yes, the tort of uh, unlawful yeah, misuse of private information. Yeah. Yes. Um, I mean, th this chapter 10 in, in this textbook is all, all about physical privacy. Sorry, what are we looking at? This is uh, divided 15 of the supplemental bundle. This is the le leading textbook on the law of privacy and the media. Yes. So, paragraph 1001, uh, the authors start uh, by defining physical privacy. It's possible to breach a person's privacy without disseminating any information against about him or her. Surreptitiously, surreptitiously videoing people in their homes or offices, relentlessly pursuing them for an interview or photograph, hacking their voicemail messages or using a bugging device, uh, are all examples of inv invasions of physical privacy. And then paragraph 1003, if your lordships and ladyship could read that paragraph. So the authors take the view that invasions of physical privacy, which is what we're dealing with here, would fall outside the scope of the tort of misuse of uh, private, uh, uh, private information and would need to be protected uh, by a piecemeal collection of common law actions, including nuisance. Does the author go on to discuss nuisance? There is a heading. Uh, page 452, Nuisance and Harassment. Uh, but the contents of that paragraph are all about harassment. Sixth and final point uh, relates to something which may have been on my lady, Lady Justice Rose's mind when she dealt with the application for permission to appeal, uh, which is that allowing 
we say that allowing nuisance to protect against privacy by overlooking would not unduly restrict development or in an undesirable way open the floodgates. And that's because there is a principle in the law of nuisance that would prevent that happening, and that is Baron Bramwell's rule of give and take. That activities necessary for the ordinary use of land cannot be a nuisance. So there'll be no nuisance as a result of some glanced or occasional looking into a home from people in everyday occupation of a home, diners in restaurants or cafes, workers at their desks in offices, or pedestrians on the pavement. It requires something quite unusual to fall outside of that principle, like what we have in this case, dedicated viewing from a viewing platform. So if I get planning permission to extend my house and build a roof terrace, which looks directly over your garden, you can't complain? No, that would, if you were simply using the roof terrace in its ordinary way, uh, I would suggest that falls within Brown Bramwell's principle. Even if it, even if it meant that um, uh, it, it, throughout the whole of the summer period you couldn't use the garden as a way you might otherwise do? O ordinary glance or occasional looking from occupiers of homes would not be a nuisance because it was it falls within the the activities necessary for the ordinary use of land. I say, yes, I say. Why is building an extension on your roof necessary for the ordinary use of that land? Why is that necessary? Well, the, the focus of the uh, principle, as I understand it, relates to the uh, use of property rather than what building is there. But I mean, I, I, I suppose... Right. But that, that's, I, that I would... might be an important point, isn't it? Do you say, well, it's if you build a patio or a elevated um, viewing uh, place in your garden, then a necessary part of using that is then that you're out there and overlooking the neighbour's garden. So it's necessary use of the your extended house once you've built that extension, which includes a, an elevated paved area for you to sit out in the summer. But similarly with the Tate Gallery, there's no necessity for them having a viewing platform, but once they've built a viewing platform, or viewing area, isn't it necessary that people go out and look at the city from it. Well, you could, you could stop what the what stage does the necessity well, okay. arise? You see Maybe I, mean? I could put my final point in this way. I accept there is some scope for argument as to how Baron Bramwell's principle would apply to other instances of overlooking. But my point is that that principle would operate as a significant control in preventing uh, the arguments in this case were well, no, I'd like to press you on that. I mean, you may be right about that, but I think it's quite an important point. So I just want to test it. You see, there are, uh, you, we, we, you very, very helpfully, in your earlier submissions, outlined the nature of the test. And we have to look both at the defendant and the claimant. As far as the defendant is concerned, you uh, highlighted the, the, the give and take part of the test, focusing on the defendant in two respects. One, was the defendant's use a necessary use for the ordinary occupation use of the property? Necessary. Secondly, even if it is necessary, what has to be done has to be done conveniently, or as I would say in modern days, reasonably. That's focusing on the defendant. Focusing on the claimant, uh, what we're looking at is the uh, any anything that reduces the amenity value of the land for an ordinary occupier of it. Those are the two tests. Now, if you take the question of overlooking in the type of domestic setting we're looking at, so let's just take 
my Lord's example of building on uh, you know, a, a roof garden, or perhaps even more possibly building on an extension uh, in order to uh, house uh, you know, parents, uh, another group of people there, creating a balcony off of a bedroom, anything like that. Now, none of those things would satisfy the test of necess necessity. They would improve the property, they would be reasonable, but they wouldn't be necessary. Then look at it from the position of the, of the claimant. So far as the claimant is concerned, um, the overlooking, which severely diminishes their privacy, and would do so for anybody who wants to occupy that property, is a severe annoyance. And so the difficulty that you get into, um, and I'm putting to you, the difficulty, you, one of the difficulties it could be said you get into, is where... Where do you stop and you start in relation to an action or nuisance? Is it possible that uh, if planning permission is given for uh, an extension, a balcony, which overlooks the adjoining garden, that the neighbour can then say, well, that's an action or nuisance that wasn't necessary for you, and it, re and it interferes substantially with my enjoyment of my property. In fact, it diminishes its value. So how, how, would you deal with, how would you deal with that in relation to item six? I mean, there would certainly, certainly be scope for argument as to how Baron Brownwell's principle would apply to the cases uh, you're uh, giving. I mean, my, my point is, first of all, that principle is an important control uh, over the application of... Um, our case to other cases, albeit I accept there would be scope for argument uh, as to uh, the scope of that principle. But there, there is an, another point I'd suggest, which is that the problem in this case has... I think what I was querying in a technical way, I wasn't trying to make it kind of a jury type, but it was your saying the rule of give and take, but I understood you to say the give and take part is the reasonable use of the defendant's property in relation to something which is necessary. I thought that's how you explain uh, the give and take point. Yes, and, and so there would be scope for argument as to wh whether you know you just look at the use of the property or wh whether you also could apply that principle to a, to a sort of new building. But, but there, there, is, there is another uh, sort of control in all of this, which is that, generally speaking, um, that there isn't a problem with privacy invasions by looking into homes because there's quite a clear uh, because people in their ordinary everyday activities tend to respect the privacy in the home so people going about their ordinary life if you see someone in their home the natural thing to do is to sort of avert your gaze the, the problem that has occurred in this case is that the visitors to the viewing gallery don't behave in that way, and quite understandably, because they are invited onto a viewing platform and invited by the Tate to engage in viewing. So they don't abide by the basic conventions and basic manners that apply in the rest of life. And so I, I, I would address your Lordship's point by saying that is another reason uh, for thinking that this is a really of unusual case, and it, and it wouldn't be well, something more unusual. Front, you, know, you don't normally get thousands of people looking into your no. home. Exactly. <laughs> so on any footing, well, it's a very unusual except case. Except you, your, your argument does seem to lead to a sort of slightly counterintuitive result, which is if the Tate Gallery was not a gallery, if it was just a viewing platform, like at the top of a shard, for example, and if what was built there was a, was a place where people go to look at the view, then it would be a necessary user for them to... Well, you need to... That, that doesn't and sound... Then, and then it, it wouldn't be an invasion of... Well, that doesn't sound a right outcome, and it can't be the right outcome, so you'd have to have a think about why Baron Bramwell's principle didn't apply in that case. But that's not the case we have here. Well, they're my submissions. Well, that, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Week, for those very clear submissions and for expressing them so succinctly in the time. We're very grateful to you. Uh, we'll start again at 2 o'clock.